Well, thank you for joining me for part two of such a necessary topic. This is going to be part two of your opportunity to receive CEU credits for your self-care best practices. And wanted to make sure you know that as we finish these particular uh, parts, this will be the closeout of the letter B in our boundary series, meaning bars. Uh, we're talking about, uh, of course, the B stands for boundaries, and then the A is for accountability, the R for reciprocate, and then the S for sanctification. I'm talking about regeneration, soul consciousness, when I'm talking about sanctification. So when we get there, get ready, get ready. Uh, to really, really uh, take good notes on that. But anyway, I want to jump right into our subject. I want to give you a scripture for references for where I'm headed at. And so get your pen and pad and listen in and please share this message. I think it'll bless someone. One of the scripture references I want to give uh, is Colossians 3 and 9. It says, Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. Okay? Just think on that. Say like that for a little bit. But I want to also give us an opportunity to think about what I talked about last time, you know, in this series where I'm talking about uh, boundaries, I thought it's important for me to close out with this particular one because we have a lot of people who are just doing a whole lot of fraud, a whole lot of fake things, and, and it's based on the decision that they make, and, and it's also based on relationships that they create. And so I want to give you this uh, particular, uh, what you want to call a devotion that I had this morning, I thought was very timely for this message. And it's coming out of First Kings uh, reference, uh, chapter 19, verse 21. And the topic is, who are you? That is, who you are is who you attract. I'll say it again. Who you are is who you attract. And so it talked about, the scripture talks about then he rose, arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. And so really, in, as far as humility is concerned, it's very, very key. And I talked about the emotional health and all of that, that is fitness. But I want to get into a couple of things with that in just a few minutes. So please get your pen and listen in. And this particular devotion says, effective leaders are always on the lookout for good people. But who get who you get is not determined by what you want, but by who you are. In most situations, you draw people who possess the same quality you do. What enabled Elijah to draw like-minded people to his side? What do you think? Well, this truth, who you are, is who you attract. Okay? It's just simple as that. The first point that I want to bring out is, number one, every leader has a measure of magnetism which is so true, we do. Number two, a leader's magnetism may impact others intellectually, emotionally, or voluntarily, okay, or voluntarily. Then number three, magnetism is neither good nor bad in itself. It depends on what a leader does with it. Number four, secure leaders draw both similar and complementary followers, okay, Number five, a leader's magnetism never remains static. I hope you're writing it down. So here's the deal. It is possible for a leader to go out and recruit people like unlike himself, okay? But it's crucial to recognize that people who are different will not naturally be attracted to him. Their quality depends on you. If you think the people you attract could be better, then it's time for you to improve yourself. Well, a lot of that comes from decisions that we make, right? A lot of that comes from things that we do. It comes from ways that we think. It comes from, you know, those areas in our lives that we start to think about things. And many times they're negative, and many times the fruit that we're bearing is really not where it needs to be. And we just simply haters, fakers, and liars in many ways. And this is the reason why we have to constantly pray for God to help us with the thing that we know that so easy to beset us. I think it's important, as I told you before, to think about the decisions that you make. I tell you how many we make in a day, over 35,000. I talk about how a lot of that has to do with our ill willness versus our wellness. 
I talk about all of that. And I also talk about the intellectual property, those things that we create, those designs or things that we have witty ideas to do and people that we connect with that are not very truthful. Uh, they got a lot of faking and shaking going on. And so we got to be very, very careful in our relationship. But guess what? That that you go out and create uh, to become a part of your life, many times these people that are part of your life, they create a whole lot of unnecessary, what I call, casualties that we get ourselves in. So let's jump in on the intellectual part first, because I'm really, really moved by the fact that when we think about the intellectual part of the things that we work so hard to create, things that we find ourselves sharing with other people even, these relationships come from thoughts, come from behaviors. These relationships come from people who we think that are shaping our self-image. And so I want to give you these six self-image types that you need to think about that's going to really, really radiate about yourself first, okay? So when you think about your intellectualism, the things that you put in front of people or share information with, I'm not going to go into all the things you need to be doing legally for your intellectual rights. You can go and get you a lawyer who takes care of those. But I want, I'm more talking to you about the the, um, the part that you need to be taking care of in, rega- in relation to relationships that you connect yourself with when you're sharing information, those things that affect you when you're talking to people or internalizing things about yourself that really causes a lot of problems. So these particular six I want you to think about when I'm talking about self-image, okay? The self-image is your mental picture, okay? Think about when you're going out As this devotion has said, remember, you decided to get this person connected to you. You know, you are like a magnet, and these people like you. Many of them, you think, got the same mindset, as I said before, and some of those things are good and some of those things are bad. But you already know. I always say get with your kind. Many of us already know some of the things that you're with people, like I always say, they pretty much, got some of your kind in you, or else you wouldn't have been weak enough to be with those people. It's very important that you look at your own self-image. So these particular six, I want to give you the first one, the self-image resulting from how you see yourself. That's number one, okay? This people who can be very dishonest and be very crooked and find ways to get information from you and then be very dishonest about those things that they say or the reason why they do that or have this discourse about you. Remember, everybody come up differently. Everybody got different ways to handle business. Some people don't have intellectual, what we call humility. And so they find themselves doing all kind of things that just are not godly. And so the second part of these six is the self-image resulting for, uh, about how others see you, okay? Uh, many times we connect with people that think, you think that they see you in this place where, you know, you're not argumentative, that you're very easygoing, and that you're very giving, and things like that, and that you really want to part. And when really they don't have that intention to part, and they have the intention to take, not bring to the table. So we got to look at where am I, uh, you know, how are they seeing me, okay? Do they see the fruit of the Spirit where that means that uh, you are drawing people to you and not away from you, or you have this content type of mentality they can see that you feel very bold in what you're doing and very strong in what you're doing. So people stop off of that. I, like I, I say in my book, uh, people just become sap suckers, and so you're drained to the point that you really can't see the enemy. Remember my last message that I talked about I don't know if it was a word I gave uh, of, the, of the week or what, but I talked about we really got to have these uh, eyes of the eagle and, most important, fish eyes, you know, so you can have that uh, peripheral discernment, so you can look to the left, to the right, in all kind of ways. That eyeball is going around because Jesus got your back because you're using wisdom to be able to see prophetically what is trying to happen before it gets to you. Number three, the self-image meaning this resulting from how you perceive the individual that sees you, okay? So remember, what, and like I always say, can you see me? And as a seer, anybody want to play play, that's why I'd be like, just go along with the, with the game. You know, go along with the thing that you think I can't see. But what God wants to do to a mature prophetic people is to see but shut your mouth. But many times people want you to respond back to see if you see them. The best thing for you to do is either not respond or just respond and say, God bless you, and move it on. Because what people like to do is try to see, can you see me? And so you got to see if this 
self-image is resulting from you being sapped so bad that you your peripheral vision, you can't see. You know, you're very resistant to change. Uh, you're seeing things about yourself that is detailing that you have the potential to be available for people when you know that God is really not putting you with those people, but you're just trying to see how you can get in there. So you, you know, get connected or see where you're going to get to go with them or how they're going to take you somewhere. But people have a lot of deception, and many of these things that are internalized, they're getting judgment about you, and you're getting judgment about them, and some of this stuff is by deception. Number four, I think I gave you number four. Uh, number five is, um, yeah, how for see the individual see you. Um, then number five is self-image resulting from how others perceive how it sees how they see themselves, okay? So many times people will connect with people because they're there to sap the strength out of you so that you can build them up. There's nothing wrong with, you know, forbearing. That's what Colossians chapter 3 is talking about, forbearing one another, carrying the burden that, that, that people may be having that God may assign to you. But don't let people just come and drain you, come and try to get information out of you, and you've given this information, and now you're trying to figure out how you're going to get out of this shape. Number six, the self-image resulting from how others perceive how others see the individual, okay? So not just you and that person, but other people outside of the relationship, how they perceive how Others see the individual, meaning you are the individual that you are in a relationship with. See, these six may or may not be accurate based on whatever your relationship is, but 9 out of 10, nine out of 10 it's going to hit home, especially where you have made the decision based on what you are thinking. Thinking, very important. This is why you have a lot of people who have a lot of deception that's going on because of the relationship, because of the self-image, because of the way you allow your ego, how, how you allow your feelings, the things that you create, or the things that you want to be able to, you know, say that this is what I've done, this is what I am, this is my root, you know, that I have that God has given me this witty idea, or this creative way to do a thing. Well, really, the fabric of the reality is that a lot of people are aware of you, of what you're doing, but they want to be sap suckers. Let me slow it down. Okay. They want to be sap suckers. They want to uh, try to say that you're highly sensitive on everything, but many of these uh, types of behaviors are coming from what the National Science Foundation calls uh, that people say the average person, that they say that the average person has about 12,000 to 60,000 thoughts per day, okay? We're not talking about the decision. Now, we're talking about just your thinking, okay? The National Science Foundation says the average person has about 12,000 to 60,000 thoughts per Per day. That's a lot. And guess what? It also says that 80% are negative. That's pretty tough. 80% of our thoughts are negative. And most of those negative thoughts are about our own self. This is why we got to look at our self-image based on the people that you're choosing to share information with or be a part of your life. This is why many times those that are highly sensitive are choosing these knowing that they're aware of them being highly sensitive about a situation, but you get it because many times people just hate to feel rejected, hate to not be included, and it's a very dangerous place. So these these 80% of negative thoughts and 90% of them are repetitive thoughts is what the statistic is showing. They're repetitive. They revisit you over and over again. These visiting cycles of these negative thoughts are there because you have made the choice to go and get connected with people who are very dishonest, who are looking to find a way to take your information that God has given you and gifted you to do. And so if we repeat those negative thoughts over and over again, then we think negative ways more than we think positive ways, then that's the kind of relationship you're going to get, and that's the kind of outcome it's going to be. So you think about that. Everything about your ego, everything that you like to be in these series, many of us are in this shape because we don't think about our self-care when it comes to making sure that we try to categorize where are we really in these boundaries. Remember I talked to you all in the very beginning of this series about the common traits of rigid, porous, and healthy boundaries. We need to understand the difference. So I talked about the rigid boundaries, that means you avoid uh, intimacy and close relationships, and a lot of that is to come from because you're highly sensitive, you already know they got a game, okay? Um, you are unlikely to ask for help, uh, has few close relationships, 
uh, very protective of personal information. Uh, you may seem detached even with romantic partners, and even in your marriage, you, you have these rigid boundaries. Or it keeps others at a distance to avoid the possibility of rejection. You know, many times people are in this rigid place because of the fact of where they've been. Many times they've had a lot of game pulled on them, a lot of things that's happened in their lifetime. So it's not that they're having a PTSD behind it. I call it a post-traumatic L behind it, symptoms. But what it's really showing you is that many times people just cannot deal with the fact that the person who has tried to play this game or tried to keep them from going where they need to be because they want to give this unhealthy mentality about where you know what they've done and they're trying to claim some of the stuff that they've created it or took it and changed the name of it or changed the wording of it so they can look like they were super spiritual, that they were so witty and wonderful. But I think this particular one in Rigid Boundaries, many of us suffer from this because we have mixed emotion when it comes to people who want to get close to us when we know you've been tricked and played with and sap slept for so long. And pretty much I believe that my boundaries are very rigid because I know no, I can see, and people that are highly sensitive and prophetic people, uh, we are very rigid because we don't have time for the game, especially a seer uh, like myself. I can see stuff, and I'm like, Lord, have mercy. Let me go and play the game with them, and I assume when Daddy, you let me tell them that I see them. Because we need to understand that rigid boundaries are very, very important in some respects. Now, the one right now I think that a lot of people are dealing with is the porous boundary. This is the reason why we get so many times wrapped up when it comes to relationships, because God has given you this wisdom or this prophetic revelation about a matter, but you overshare. This is a problem that I want to talk about in just a few minutes on part three, because uh, I'm getting off here because you, you know our list is span is very limited. So that's why I'm going to take it to part three. But I think that you overshare too much. Uh, you talk too much, and yeah, you know, it's good that you got good ideas and God has blessed you with things and you're ready to show that. But emotionally and physically, and other things, otherwise, you need to be quiet. You're sharing too much. You're too porous. You know, you want to pour it out a lot. You want to show it out a lot on Facebook and everywhere else. You know, you want everybody to see you got the new car. You want everybody to see you got the new man. You want everybody to see you got these label shoes and a brand new house. And so, you know, you're too porous. You have difficulty saying no to the request of others. You're too porous. So you, everything is yes, so let me see. I'm going to think about it. I'm going to pray about it. And everybody know I'm very rich. It's just no is no. And not that I'm not sensitive to your feelings, but I already can see where you're trying to go with the game. Uh, and if I say yes, you can rest assured Daddy's going to give me some kind of dream or something to show me that you got game. So I'm pretty much, because uh, I spend time with the Lord. That's part, part, part of the problem. We don't pray about our relationship. As I said earlier on, we have all these negative thoughts. I ain't going to have nothing negative. I'm going to pray so Abba can show me what if I have negative that now I need to call out your name and ask God to show me how I need to serve you? This is what we're not doing. We're not praying about the individual. We're praying against them, and we're trying to do all kind of witchcraft. We need to be learning how to say no and learn how to say yes when God is talking to us. Then the other part of this for us is being over-involved with others' problems. Too often you are involved with things that people don't need to be involved in. This is the reason why people know all your business and know all your information intellectually and physically and emotionally. This is the reason why. Because you share too much information. You think, oh, well, they real kind to me. You're having all this discourse, exchanging ideas, talking about different stuff and being debatable about it, just try to see whether or not they can get their opinion about it. You know, they know how to smooth it in so they can get you to share, you know, and stuff like that. Then here you go, oh, well, I already knew that. Oh, no, that was really my idea. But really what it is, we got these haters and fakers. We got these people who are troubled emotionally. Remember when I talked about those three areas that drive us on a daily basis when we make decisions to be haters, haters, fakers, many of them. We're still dealing with fear, fear of rejection, fear of shame, fear of the unknown, you know, fear of this failure. You know, so you got the love, hate, and fear. These are the three that drive people. People are so jealous today, it's just pathetic. And this is the reason why we have that Cain murdering spirit that may not be in the physical realm as much as it is, especially among leaders. They have this Cain mentality that they're going to pull you down like a snow crab and make sure you don't get up. They're going to make sure you be pulled down or make sure they don't do anything that's going to help you grow. I don't want to preach. But actually what they're doing is setting their own self up because they're the one that's not going to go nowhere because you reap 
what you sow. Now, look here. You're over-involved with other people's problems. First of all, there's a difference in problems in serving. God wants to see where is your heart in serving. When you have porous boundaries, that means you talk too much, you find yourself thinking it's a healthy thing that you're doing, when actually it's a rigid and or a porous thing that God is saying it's not a healthy boundary. Because first of all, you don't know which one is the other anyway, because you don't know how to gauge your boundary anyway. You don't know how to look and see what God is trying to get you to work out smoothly so you can work smart and not hard. The next thing about being poor is you depend on the opinions of others. That's a bad shape to be in. Hallelujah. If I was one that waiting on somebody to to, to see which way they're going and what I'm going to do, I'd never got nothing done all these 45 plus years. No way. No way. First of all, I already knew I was going to be rejected because of my message. We need to make sure we understand that when we have a message that is very bold and that you have a rigid sometimes uh, answer or way, people don't like order versus making sure that you make sure that you're being truly sensitive to what God is telling you to do. But many people have a tendency to want to play like it's God and it's nobody but their emotions that they've been very porous about because they're dependent on others' opinion. They're not dependent on what God is saying, so they want to conform to somebody else's opinion. And God watches it. I keep trying to tell people everything. He knows the thought and the intent of the heart before you can even think of deliver the message or the lie that you're telling somebody. Anyway, I just gave you the scripture in, uh, in Colossians chapter 3. He says here very clearly, he said in verse 9, let not one to another, he said, lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. But we tend to have this thing that causes us to lie, which I don't know. I tell people all the time, I don't know what you're lying to me, fucker. I'm, t- I'm definitely going to be rigidly true, you know, frankly true, okay? Uh, because as you have been played a lot, you're like, nah, 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 you got to pray, okay? So I'm going to be truthful with you and making sure that the time that I need to tell you that I see you so you can get ready for that. Because first of all, when I'm telling you the truth, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm going to tell you the truth. We're going to talk about it later because I know that God then got you ready to receive truth, okay? But we want to make sure that we depend on other people's opinion. You ain't going to never walk in truth. This is why you're going to have a lot of dishonest discourse. When you're exchanging ideas, you're going to have a lot of dishonest things that's going to go on in your own life and ministry and family because you're playing the lie card. You're playing the secret thing that's causing you to fail and be derailed. And then here's the second thing about being porous is accepting of abuse or disrespect, okay? Many of you have accepted that, that, that abuse and disrespect way too long, and this is the reason why you have a lot of people who have continued to play you like a, like I say, like a violin or a guitar. They play you based on where you are, you know, based on what you're thinking because it's, it's out pouring right out of you. And anybody that can see clearly or got any relationship with God, they can see if you're lying or playing or just trying to, you know, pretend to be somewhere or be somebody that you're not. We need to, it's very important that you pray about the rigid, pray about the poorest, and then the final thing about the disrespect, remember, what you sow is what you reap, right? When you think that God ain't seeing it and he see everything and know everything, Okay, your personal boundaries are not just limited to rules that you set to yourself. Your personal boundaries are rules and things that God has set based on his biblical principles for your life that you remain healthy, you remain strong, so you won't be so porous. And this final thing about porous boundaries is the fear of rejection. So if they do not comply with whatever you want, the fear of rejection, that if you don't say something or, or do something a certain way or timely, then they may not receive you or they may move away from you. Well, sometimes they need to move away from you. Sometimes God wants them to move away from you. Sometimes God is trying to show you some areas that are not good for you, that are dishonest, and or that you have been dishonest. So God is trying to speak to you, even now as I'm talking to you, I pray that God will let you be able to see this porous boundary. I bind that spirit now that you become very porous no longer, and that you will not be over-involved with other people's problems, and that you will not overshare. I speak that over you even now, that you will no longer be porous, that you will speak to God about having a healthy boundary, about being rich, about being things that you need to ask for help when you know you need it, and that you will ask God to show you how to protect your information without being afraid that somebody's going to share it or take something from you. But most of the time, dear God, I pray that these people who are in this shape, that they will realize that you want them to have healthy boundaries, that you want them to have values and opinions, that 
that you want them not to compromise or conform. So I speak that over you either now in the name of Jesus, that you will grow and mature, and that you will not lie, and that you will know that even these intimate relationships that you are with, that God will show you how to set boundaries that are healthy in the name of Jesus. So a healthy boundary, as I've been trying to give in these series, is values owned by what God has given you, that you were born with, that you realized you were reared with, these values are your own opinion, okay? They're healthy and that you're not trying to rule or witchcraft or gain nobody. You are trying to make sure that everything that God is saying to you is yay and amen, okay? Okay, you're not doing that. You're making sure that everything that God is showing you is timely and is seasonal and that God has appointed it. And so the next thing about the healthy boundary is it doesn't compromise your value. It's, uh, it doesn't share all your personal information. And, you know, and you don't think about oversharing this stuff because you already know who's honest and who's not because God has given you that opportunity to pray for that person and give you that opportunity to make sure that you don't have to lie to try to get along or to compromise or try to see if you can get your foot in any door. Uh, you know, some people, like I said before, are jumping through windows because the door is not opening or you know, they're trying to push it down. But you got to know what your personal wants are, your personal needs are, and you are to take those to the Lord. You know, and accepting things is when others say no. It should be okay, and it should be okay you to say no without them thinking that you're being rigid. So if they think you're being rigid, so be it. You know, because you can clearly can see they call me cocky, call me whatever you want to, but I definitely know the apostolic all of my life. I already know, and you should be knowing too, what you're going to be drawing to you, that magnetism, it, it should not be static, it should not be something you're trying to figure out, you should be able to know the difference between, uh, how to say, control and uh, order. You should know uh, accountability. You should know that, especially if you are a leader, you know, you got to recognize what is the difference between what I am trying to give you versus what you're trying to bring me. I don't want to preach. Lord, help me today. You know, you know, some cultures are different in their expectations when it comes to boundaries. But many of us already know some of these things I just said to you because you're very porous. Many of these come from family, things that you grew up in or things that, that's difficult for you. But it's up to you. These boundaries that I'm sharing right now is primarily for you to also think about in the prophetic realm why people can't connect to us because we are very highly sensitive in the things that we do. We will, you know, have these times in our lives where just it's stress will come because we can feel, you know, in our field, these things that are unconsciously happening. We can feel them. We realize that they reflect a lot of things that we're seeing or that we're feeling. And, you know, some people can't stand to be in these crowds. You know, I don't mind being in crowds because I'm not claustrophobic with anybody or anything, you know, but God is blessed me with that. But when we talk about overwhelming crowds, we talk about sometimes people just shut down. They withdraw. They don't want to be, you know, their sensory can't stimulate it. So you need to realize that some people are going to be overwhelmed in crowds. Some people are going to be rejected because of the prophetic oil on their lives. But when I come back, in part three, I want to close out this uh, boundary that I'm talking about. I'm going to close out the B, and so I'm coming back shortly, so be sure and look for part three on this. Then I'm going to be talking about a little bit more about uh, this part when it comes to people and their ways when it comes to how they handle themselves as far as being dishonest, being, uh, being dishonest when it comes to your intellectual property, when it comes to your opinions and things like that, things that you may say or things that you may do that's concerning witty ideas. And so I'll say a couple of things concerning that in, in, in number three. I'm also going to close out with why it's very difficult for people who are prophetic people, people that are feelers, people that do have a high sensitivity to uh, atmospheres and people, you know, emotionally, you know. And a lot of these things, we, we grew up being sensitive as children because we were going through a lot of trauma. But I want to share with you about how people can tend to, you know, be so uh, technically, I say, so right or so intellectually right uh, to the point that they have become very dishonest right in your face boldly. Okay, and so I want to talk to you about that when I come back on part three. I want to talk about why it's so hard for this relationship to come forward, especially when people have a critical spirit about the gift of prophecy, especially when you're learning, uh, at least trying to learn to live with the frustrations of this sensitivity that you have 
and uh, and uh, learn to live with this uh, part of rejection. Not saying that you have to receive it and eat it or anything, because rejection is part of being saved. I'll be back shortly. I pray that you listen to part three, and please share the message.